Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Abaco Science Alliance Conference webinar. Um, we still have a few people um, trickling in, but I'm gonna go ahead and start with the introduction. Um, Friends of the Environment has been hosting the Abaco Science Alliance Conference since 2004. Um, and for reasons that we all understand, uh, we weren't able to host it in 2020. So we're bringing it to you here via this webinar. And we're so excited to have so many of our partners um, students and teachers joining us today. Some of you may be new to Friends, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the organization um, and why we're here. Friends of the Environment is a nonprofit organization that was established in 1988 by a group of concerned citizens here in Hopetown um, with a desire to support conservation of Abaco's natural resources. At the time, um, our environment was under a lot of pressure from unsustainable activities, um, illegal dumping, wild dolphin capture, um, reef fish capture for the aquarium trade, um, and even just the increase in tourism uh, in the absence of uh, policies to support our environment. Friends started as an all vol volunteer organization, but we've grown um, to have a full-time staff of five and a dedicated board of 10 um, from all across Abaco who represent diverse sectors such as fishing, teaching, um, small businesses, uh, and the public sector. Our mission is to preserve the environment of Abaco through education, conservation, and research facilitation. Education has become the cornerstone of Friends' ongoing programs, reaching over 23,000 students, raising awareness, and cultivating the next generation of Bahamian environmental ambassadors. Friends was able to open an education center in 2007, and this became a second home to many of our students who grew up through our programs. Unfortunately, much of that changed in 2019. Um, with the impact of Hurricane Dorian. I'm sure you've heard a lot of the facts, um, but the reason that we're here today is to talk about the impacts of an unusual storm event. Um, hurricane Dorian was the strongest recorded hurricane to make landfall in the Bahamas. Uh, we experienced sustained winds at 185 miles per hour with gusts at 220 miles per hour. Some people are calling it a category five plus storm or a category six storm. It truly was unusual. Um, the islands experienced surge up to 23 feet. Uh, and this map shows you the path of the storm across the islands. Um, Dorian moved very slowly and lingered over the islands for more than 48 hours. Um, at one point, it moved only 25 miles in 24 hours, which is the shortest distance tracked by an Atlantic hurricane since 1965. Unfortunately, Friends, like many others, was not immune to the impacts of Dorian, and we lost our beloved education center. <clears throat> this was the home to our offices, um, our classroom, um, even the only natural history museum in the Bahamas. Um, so we lost the majority of our supplies and equipment. Uh, we also lost the um, solar system that powered our campus. Uh, but thankfully, the Frank Kenyon Center that we opened in 2015 was spared the majority of Dorian's impact um, and only had minor damage. Um, actually, we were able to utilize the center right away um, to house relief groups and Samaritan's Purse actually stayed there and made it their uh, headquarters for over a year um, while they led relief efforts on the island. Um, so it was very useful to have uh, the facility available. Um, we've recently completed the repairs to the Kenyon Center and are happy to say that it's still operating, um, hosting uh, research groups, student groups, um, and other community groups um, at a reduced capacity due to COVID. We have also restored our solar panels um, through the support of a UNDP Jeff small grant program grant. Um, and we are in the process of uh, finalizing support so that we can also change our lead acid batteries to lithium batteries. Um, and we're very excited when we can finally get our um, sustainable power source back online. We have um, 
not stopped. We are determined to restore our campus and get our programs back online. Um, and in order to do that, we have uh, started a campaign to rebuild our education center, but not only rebuild, we are um, improving um, on what we had by uh, creating this building, the Learning Center. Um, we are excited to say that we have approved plans um, and we are well on our way through our campaign to raise the funds to build it. We are excited um, that we'll be able to offer uh, more programs, dedicated spaces for students to learn, for communities to meet um, and spend time together to appreciate and reflect on the importance of our, our environment. Uh, this building um, is a really welcoming space. Um, this is an exciting image of what we hope it may look like. Um, but the building itself will house an exploratorium, which is a new and expanded uh, museum slash kids center, <clears throat> as well as our offices, four offices for partner NGOs, a media room, meeting space, a larger classroom um, and kitchen which will serve our programs, but also be available in the event of future disasters so that we can facilitate community relief efforts. Um, the building will tie into our existing buildings and it will be operated um, as sustainably as possible. If, if you would like to learn more about our campaign to rebuild um, and might have a way that you'd like to join us, um, feel free to contact us anytime. Um, after the webinar, you can find our contacts on our website at friendsoftheenvironment.org. Um, you can also reach us on social media, um, Friends of the Environment on Facebook and Instagram. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Leanna, who is going to um, moderate this part of the webinar. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. We are so excited that you are here with us today for ASAC. Um, for those of you who don't know me, like Olivia was saying, my name is Liana. I work at Friends of the Environment as the Outreach Coordinator. Um, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping rules today for the webinar. Um, so at the end of the presentations, we will be hosting a question and answer session. Um, you could submit questions using the Q&A feature or the chat box. So you may notice that um, you do not have access to your video or microphone, but you will find the Q&A box um, right on the bar below your screen next to um, the chat or participant buttons. Um, and as you can see, this session will be recorded. Um, for our panelists, we just would like to remind you guys to um, mute yourselves if you are not presenting, um, and you will have the ability to share your screen um, after Lindisha introduces you guys. So I'm just going to hand it over to Lindisha Curry, our education officer, to introduce our first panelist for today. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lindy Shakari, the Education Officer here at Friends, and our first presenter is Dr. Stephanie Archer, who is an assistant professor at Louisiana University's Marine Consortium, where she leads the Benthic Ecology Lab. Generally, her research program is focused on the ecology, conservation, and management of coastal habitats like seagrass beds, sponge grounds, and oyster reefs. Stephanie has conducted research on Abaco since 2012, where her work has largely focused on how sponges contribute to the health and biodiversity of seagrass beds. Thank you so much for the introduction. Share my screen. Are we all good? Can you guys see it? All right. Um, thank you so much for having me here to talk to you today about Abaco seagrass beds and contaminant levels in the nearshore environment after Dorian. Um, I'm really honored to be here for myself as well as on behalf of all of my co-authors that you can see here on the screen. 
So the Bahamas has extensive seagrass beds, some of the most extensive seagrass beds in the world. Uh, the last estimate that was done using satellite imagery was that there's over 65,000 square kilometers of seagrass in the Bahamas. And Abaco hosts quite a large amount of seagrass as well. These seagrass beds can be really important for nearshore ecosystems in many different ways. Uh, they provide structured habitat for fish and invertebrates that live in that area. They can sequester carbon, they play important roles in nutrient cycling, and they have important trophic connections to other ecosystems, including coral reefs, and they are where the major foraging grounds for charismatic megafauna like green sea turtles. One of the things that uh, seagrass beds do is like I mentioned, is sequester carbon. And the reason that they are able to do this is they um, change how water flows over the bottom of the ocean. And this change in water flow actually slows the water down and leads to particles being entrained within the seagrass beds. Over time, this leads to a buildup of sediments that would otherwise be um, washed away and removed, either resuspended into the water column or removed from the system. Now, in a healthy seagrass bed, this is a really good thing. However, in the aftermath of events like Hurricane Dorian, where a significant amount of the infrastructure on Abaco washed into our near shore environments, we became concerned that not only would the seagrass beds themselves have been impacted by Dorian, but that they might actually be serving to trap contaminants that were introduced through debris and storm runoff into the nearshore system. So these concerns led to the co creation of the group of people that I'm here representing to um, study the effects of Dorian on nearshore systems, specifically seagrass beds and contaminant loads in those systems. So we set out to answer a few different questions. The first is just how did the seagrass beds weather Dorian? The second was, are Abaco's nearshore systems contaminated in the aftermath of Dorian? Did those contaminants get trapped into seagrass beds? And did that result in animals that live in seagrass beds becoming contaminated? Um, so I'm gonna walk through the results that we do have, as well as just what we've done to address the rest of the questions and when we might hope to share more answers with you. So the bulk of the data that we do have is addressing this first question of how did seagrass beds weather Dorian? And so to answer this question, we conducted surveys at multiple sites across Abaco, ranging from Treasure Key down to the Bight of Old Robinson. And we selected these sites because they were sites that we had some level of pre-storm data at. We had an idea of where the seagrass beds were and what they looked like at least in the decade before Dorian. Um, the sites are gonna be colored using the same color scheme throughout my talk. And it generally goes from relative intensity um, being the darkest red to um, down to blue, the, the least intense storm conditions that we think these sites uh, experienced during Dorian. And again, that's relative. So we sampled the, we surveyed these seagrass sites multiple times in the aftermath of Dorian, two months after Dorian, eight, 21, and 27 months after Dorian. And so what you're looking at here is um, a graph showing how dense the primary habitat forming seagrass species is, Thalassia testudinum. So it's the number of seagrass shoots per meter squared over time. So you see our pre Dorian data here. Um, and then over on the other side of the dashed line, how it's fared after all, in all of our surveys after Dorian. And again, the, the red is the most in, intensely impacted site and the, the blue is where we think the, the storm conditions were the, the least intense. And what you can see is that in the sites that we think experienced um, very intense hurricane conditions, we actually did not find much Thalassia after the storm. Um, and two of these sites, Treasure Key and Hills Creek, that low level of Thalassia has maintained in all of our surveys since. And Camp Abaco, which is right down in middle, um, 
the middle portion of Attica right there, just south of Marsh Harbor, the Thalassia populations have rebounded and densities have started to increase back towards pre-storm levels. In Snake Key and the Bight of Old Robinson, where conditions were less intense, um, the seagrass did seem to dip down a bit after Dorian, but has um, really rebounded afterwards, at least the Thalassium. Uh, so we actually, I've been talking about Thalassia, but there's three species of seagrass in the Bahamas. Uh, we have Thalassia testudinum, Serengodium filiformes, and Halidule radii. And these species um, differ in how large they grow, how quickly they grow, and therefore really differ in how quickly they will show up at a site. Thalassia testudinum, which has historically been the dominant seagrass on Abaco, is a late successional species, which means that we expect it to be the dominant species when the system hasn't been disturbed um, in, in quite a while. Whereas Halidule radii is, an early, is a pioneer species, meaning it will show up first when a system has been disturbed. And so down here on the bottom, we see a panel of figures, we have Thalassia testudinum, Serengodium filiforme, and Halidule radii, and an abundance score going from zero being not present to five being the dominant uh, taxa in the plot. And what you can see is that we, at the impacted sites, we saw high abundances of Halidule radii right after the storm, and those have maintained. Um, same thing with the Serengodium filiforme, although Serengodium has been a lot less abundant than the other two seagrass species, regardless of site. We see a similar pattern when we look at other primary producers in the system. So the other major benthic primary producer is macroalgae. And so this is a plot that shows you, uh, or allows us to put community composition in two dimensions. So there's a lot of species of macroalgae. And the main take home of this plot is that two points that are closer together are more similar. And so the further apart uh, two points are, the less similar their communities. And what you can see is right after the storm, the less impacted sites tended to group over to one side and the more impacted sites had a lot of variability but also tended to group over to the other side. As time has gone on, Camp Abaco has moved over towards the less impacted sites where Treasure Key and Hills Creek to continue to separate out their communities look different. The last thing we did in the seagrass beds is looked at water column oxygen flux. And what this can tell us is a little bit about the ratio of primary production to respiration in the water column or how active little single cell um, algae are at conducting primary productivity or primary production in the water column. It also gives us an idea of how much oxygen might be available for other taxa like conch and lobster in the system. And what you can see is that across Treasure Key, Camp Abaco, Snake Key, and the Bight of Old Robinson, we don't see too much variability. Um, Snake Key is a little bit lower than the others, but in general, there's more primary production in the water column than respiration. However, at Hills Creek, um, there is more respiration going on than primary production in the water column. So this suggests to us that there's something very fundamentally different going on at Hills Creek that we might need to look into more. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I don't actually have any results yet, but I'm gonna talk you through what we've been doing and what results we expect to have. So are our, our Abaco near shore systems contaminated? To try to address this question in the immediate aftermath of the storm, we couldn't get really fancy passive water samplers over there. So we took advantage of what was available on Abaco, which was oysters. So oysters are filter feeders, meaning they bring water into their, um, into their bodies, remove particles and expel it. So this means that over time, they will start to look like their environment. Um, so if there are contaminants in the water column, we would expect to see them in oysters. So what we did is we collected oysters down at Crossing Rocks in Southern Abaco, which is a relatively unimpacted site. And then we put them into bags and transplanted them up at all of these sites across Abaco, including uh, six sites around Marsh Harbor. The oysters were then left for a minimum of 45 days. And we picked them up and uh, collected the tissue and froze that for further analysis. 
To address the question of whether or not contaminants got trapped in seagrass beds and got um, transferred up the food web into animals that live in the seagrass bed, when we were surveying the seagrass beds, we collected seagrass and sediments from each of the plots that we surveyed. We also opportunistically collected conch and lobster um, tissue samples. All of these samples, the sediment, the seagrass, the oysters, the conch and the lobster were successfully exported finally in December of 2021. And analysis for heavy metals and hydrocarbons are underway at the University of New Orleans. So the take home message here is that seagrass beds, particularly in the Northern part of Abaco were impacted by Dorian. Some have started to recover while others have not. And we hope to fill in more gaps about um, the role of contaminants and how contaminated our nearshore systems are relatively soon. So with that, I'd like to thank our funding for this study and just say thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Archer, for sharing your research with us. Next, we are going to hear from Justin Lewis. He is a Bahamian native from Freeport, Grand Bahama, being raised on the island around the water. His passion for fishing, science, and the ocean started from a very young age. Justin attended St. Francis Xavier University on the east coast of Canada where he received a BA in Aquatic Resources with Public Policy and Social Research. After he, he completed his undergraduate degree, Justin went to the University of York in England, where he completed an MSc in Marine Environmental Management. Justin is the Bahamas Initiative Manager for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust and is in charge of leading conservation and restoration efforts, outreach and education, including bonefish spawning site identification and mangrove restoration. All right, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, is my screen big? Just wanna make sure. Yes. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, um, Friends of the Environment crew, for putting this on. I know it's been a long time since we had ASAC, but I'm happy you guys got it going again. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you guys about the mangrove restoration project we have going on in northern Bahamas between um, Abaco and Grand Bahama. So I'll go through this quick. Everybody knows Hurricane Dorian, most devastating storm never hit the Bahamas, caused billions of dollars in damage. Uh, but especially it impacted uh, fishing communities. So between Grand Bahama and Abaco, um, flats fishing in particular brings in over $50 million. So people lost their boats, um, lost their livelihoods, multiple lodges shut down. So it really impacted those fishermen. Um, well, also what we wanted to know was what impacts were there to the natural environment after Hurricane Dorian? So we did some informal um, surveys, uh, which found that the underwater habitat, including seagrasses, um, like Stephanie mentioned, are they're, they're still intact. There was some damage, but nothing compared to what happens in the mangroves, which I'll get to in a second. Thankfully, the bonefish population um, was still healthy, like not even two weeks after the storm, went to a bunch of spots where there were large schools of fish and they were there. So that was good to see. But like I said earlier, it was very clear that after Hurricane Dorian, the mangroves were very heavily impacted. So just so you guys get an understanding of like how destructive uh, the storm was to the mangrove system, this is a little, uh, this is a little key called Brush Key off East Grand Bahama. Beautiful little key, uh, bonefish were around it, permit were around it. It was a, uh, it was a rookery for, I think I counted like 15 different species of seabirds. A uh, very healthy, very vibrant, vibrant little mangrove key. Um, and this is what it looked like after the storm, basically like it didn't even exist. There were black mangroves and red mangroves on this key that were hundreds of years old, and it was uh, totally decimated. And this is only a little snapshot of what the rest of Grand Bahama and Abaco looked like after the storm. 
So working with University of Alabama, we did some more formal surveys using remote sensing um, and ground truthing. So in Abaco, there was 54,000 acres of mangroves um, before the storm. And then after Dorian, uh, we found that there was 40% of Abaco's mangroves were damaged and destroyed, which is about 21,000 acres. Please excuse uh, the map. It, it didn't, with the, with the software, um, it didn't fully capture every single mangrove because the majority of the mangroves in, in gra between Graham and Abaco are dwarf red mangroves. And so it's just because of the height, didn't capture it. So most of that, where you see red, there should be red continued over. Um, same for Grand Bahama. So before the storm, there was 31,000 acres. Basically, the entire north side of Grand Bahama uh, should be green, including all, all of the east end. After the storm, we found that Dorian damage destroyed 73% of our, our mangroves here in Grand Bahama, which is about 22,000 22, acres. So between the two islands, we have over 40,000 acres of mangroves that were damaged slash destroyed. So after we did all this, all this work, uh, we decided that something needed to be done. Um, so we decided to partner up with Bahamas National Trust, uh, Friends of the Environment, and MANG. They are a clothing company in uh, Florida that does, does a lot of mangrove restoration work. So the overall goal of this project, it's a multi-year project. We're trying to plant at least 100,000 mangroves over the next five years in an effort to kickstart recovery. Um, the areas that we, we plant in um, will be monitored. We also have monitoring sites that we did uh, before some of the community plants we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then also as important, we're gonna use this uh, restoration program um, as an education outreach opportunity um, for the local community to get a better understanding of the importance of mangroves uh, and coastal resiliency. So we've built nurseries um, in Grand Bahama and Abaco. And so what we're doing is collecting propagules uh, from around the Bahamas. They're primarily, I'm trying to get as many as I can from the Northern Bahamas. There's a there's a small population left in West Grand Bahama and then Southern Abaco, there's still a lot of adult mangroves, so we're collecting a lot from there. Um, so we're growing these propagules in the nurseries um, from six months to a year before we outplant them. And yeah, I have three uh, nurseries in Grand Bahama and one currently at the Canyon Center in Abaco. And so basically this is the process. We collect the propagules. I got my interns um, sorting them and planting them in our troughs, which we fill with a mixture of fresh and salt water. And then the picture on your right um, is what they look like after two to three months. So it's a controlled system and these plants grow really well. So for site selection, so from the assessment map um, and bonefish guides knowledge is, how we're, is what we're using to identify the areas most need for restoration. And then also we're focusing restoration areas that had previously living large adult fringing mangroves, because those are the areas that have the right nutrient loads to allow these trees to get to adult size. And that thus produce propagules. And a lot of these areas are along mangrove creeks, which one is, is great for uh, collecting nutrients, but then also once these trees get to adult size, it'll be great for dispersing uh, the propagules to surrounding areas. So for the planting to date, uh, we've planted close to 20,000 mangroves. We have a planting coming up this weekend. So that's gonna push us over 20,000 mangroves for this project thus far. Um, and right now nurse, our nursery capacity is 32,000. Uh, the planting process is pretty simple, similar to what they do to tree planting up north. We have these dibbles, which you see junior holding, these orange dibbles. It's basically a giant spade, stick it, in, stick it into the ground, open a hole, we have Lindisha there doing a great job. She puts the mangrove in, covers it up onto the next spot. And so with anywhere from 20 to 30 people, we can plant 2,500 mangroves in, in a couple hours. So it's a pretty efficient process. So this is just a quick map of uh, where we planted thus far. Uh, the, red, the red dots are where the monitoring sites are. So we have four in Grand Bahama and I have five in Abaco um, and the green, Green dots are where we have community planting sites thus far. So we've done 10 community plantings, um, sorry, just 10 plantings in total thus far. So for the monitoring, um, 
we started um, this project working with Dr. Craig Dahlgren, and now we started working um, with uh, Dr. Ethan Freed and his, his assistant, Jenny Morris, from, from Eleuthera um, on this. And so basically what we did was we take these eight by eight plots, and what we did was we, compare, we compared survivorship uh, and growth rate of um, seedlings versus propagules, sorry, yes, yeah, seedlings versus propagules. And then within that, uh, we broke it down to clumped versus individuals. And so we did this to help guide our restoration efforts uh, moving forward. So I just finished collecting data for, for one year. Um, so thus far for Grand Bahama, overall survival rate of both propagules and um, seedlings was 41%. Um, breaking that down some more, seedling survival rate it was 63% and propagule survival rate was much lower than 19%. And this, um, this data actually supports literature, sorry, results from um, other areas around, other restoration efforts from around the world. Then in Abaco, all we did, we didn't do um, propagule versus seedling. We just did seedlings purely for that, for that planting and overall survival rate was 69%. Breaking it down even more, um, in Grand Bahama for, sorry, let me go back for a second. So individual for when we planted the individuals, uh, we plant, separated them two to three feet apart. And then for the clumped, we, we'd have, we take clumps of nine um, and have them only a few inches apart from one another. So in Grand Bahama for the individual seedling survival rate, it was 65%. Um, individual propagule survival rate was uh, 17%. Clump seedling survival rate was 62%, and clump propagule survival rate was 21%. So that just shows us that planting for one, planting seedlings um, is the way to go, which we which we've been doing. And also literature has shown that uh, planting them clumped together is better, even though uh, from what we've seen, it's it's pretty close um, to one another for the survival rate. And then for Abaco, clump survival rate was 74%. Um, and then in, for the individuals, it was 63%. So expected benefits from this project, we want to kickstart recovery of the mangroves in Grand Bahama and Abaco, um, just because the devastation was so vast from what you guys saw. We have over 40,000 acres gone that there is very little seed source left, especially in, in the northern marls um, of Abaco and then on the north side of Grand Bahama. So we just thought we'd, we'd help mother, mother Nature along a little bit. Um, by doing this also, we're hoping to restore biodiversity and restore coastal resiliency, because as we all know, mangroves are very important um, for protecting our coastlines, especially against storms, storm surge and erosion. And then also again, to educate the public about mangroves and then this will hopefully promote advocacy for moving forward for when we need more protections for mangroves, which we definitely will need moving into the future with over 35% of the world's mangroves uh, disappeared since I think 2001. So moving forward, um, our goal for 2022 um, is to plant uh, 30,000 mangroves. Uh, we have major planting, so we have a planting coming up this weekend, um, which I'm excited for or in the marls. Um, and then we have two major plantings coming up on Earth Day um, and World Oceans Day. Um, so for both of those, what we're, what we're planning on doing is doing simultaneous plantings on the same day. We tried to do it for World Oceans Day, but the weather wouldn't allow us, unfortunately. And then uh, also to expand our mangrove nursery to house at least 40,000 plants. So I know I covered a lot there. Um, I, I'm not sure, are we doing questions at the end? Liana or Olivia? Yes, we will address questions at the end. But okay. if, if you, if um, attendees would like, they can type it in the Q and A box now, and we will address them at the end. Up next, we will hear from Dr. Krista Sherman and Will Green from the Perry Institute of Marine Science. Dr. Sherman is a marine scientist with more than a decade of research and conservation experience, and is also the first Bohemian female with a PhD in the marine sciences. 
She recently completed a self-funded PhD in biological sciences at the University of Exeter. Krista has actively contributed to several national research projects like the Jeff FSP, Building a Sustainable National MPA Network in the Bahamas, the Mitigating the Threats of Invasive Alien Species in the Insular Caribbean Project, Bahamas Protected and Coral Restoration and Monitoring under the Atlantis Blue Project. Will Green is a research associate at the Perry Institute for Marine Sciences, specializing in geographic information systems, coral reef pho photogrammetry, and 3D modeling. He is based in Burlington, Vermont, but often joins the research team in the Bahamas to participate in field work. His goal is to use technology to advance science and to inspire the public to care about the environment and conservation. Thanks, Andisha. Um, so Will and I are gonna tag team both talks and while he pulls up the first one, I uh, just wanna thank you um, and Olivia and Liana for organizing ASAC virtually. Uh, so this first talk is going to talk about um, brief impacts from Hurricane Dorian um, and the prognosis for recovery. So for those of you that aren't familiar, we work for the Perry Institute for Marine Science, next slide Will, and our research really aims to support uh, healthy, biodiverse and resilient marine ecosystems and provide science-based recommendations for sustainable resource management. Next slide. So in 2019, we embarked on an expedition around the Little Bahama Bank to assess the condition of reef habitats there. Um, and that ended up being fortuitous because we had that pre-storm data to go back to. So we went back out in October 2019, a month after the storm, and again in April of last year. For our in-water assessments, we primarily focused on uh, benthic coral and fish communities using the agro survey methodology, which is a standardized protocol. And Will will talk to you in more detail about some of the photogrammetry and how that's used for sort of a deeper dive into the condition of reef health. Unfortunately, we have not been able to process uh, water quality and sediment samples as yet, so we won't be talking about this uh, for this talk. Next slide, Will. So to kick things off, um, we developed a hurricane damage index. So looking at actual physical damage to corals themselves or reefs, um, looking at both natural and man-made sources of debris, um, like uh, casuarina trees or the ladder that you see in the images on the top, uh, as well as the amount of sedimentation on the reefs um, and any signs of coral bleaching. So if you go to the next slide, then we can cumulatively add those scores from all those different indicators. Um, and what we, what we saw is that generally the sites with the highest HDI scores were following along the path, the trajectory of the storm, which is in red right there. Um, but we did have a few exceptions to these. So there were some sites that weren't on the direct path of the storm, like the site um, in Grand Bahama um, on the bottom here, uh, where we saw major damage. Um, and conversely, in Abaco, we had a site up in the northern part of Abaco where it was on the direct path of the storm, but we saw minimal damage. Uh, next slide. So overall for the Bahamas, we had, um, based on this sort of qualitative uh, look at these indicators, we saw that, that there were severe damage at five of the sites uh, where we saw significant loss in structural complexity and damage to, to individual corals. But there was some variability overall across the Little Bahama Bank with some sites showing minimum damage as well. Um, next slide, Will. Uh, in terms of coral leaching, this we saw impact several reefs with 25% of corals impacted on some reef sites. And the species that were mainly impacted uh, included some of the reef, important reef building species like the Orbicella fabiolata up here on the top left, but we also saw bleaching uh, in some of the important brain corals like Pseudodiploria strigosa on the bottom um, as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Will. So let's just take a quick look at fish, what's happening uh, with fish community structures at the island level um, for all species, for both uh, Abaco and Grand Bahama, we're seeing a decline 
in, in biomass. Um, if we look at some of the functional groups like the herbivores, parrot fishes, surgeon fishes, we're also seeing a decline, as well as for commercially important species like snappers and groupers. Um, looking at the site level that Will's pulled up here, we did notice that there were some significant differences at a few sites where the decreases are shown in red. Um, and one site where there was an in increase in blue, but generally what we're seeing uh, overall is not much change at the site level uh, in terms of fish biomass. Um, the next slide. So we did get back out uh, to sort of reassess some of these sites in April 2021. We are still in the process of analyzing all of that data, but just based on our qualitative observations, uh, it appears that there is some recovery in some areas and some sites fish populations appear to be healthy, but we, what we really need to do is process that data to see whether or not um, things have stabilized, if things are increasing, or if we're seeing declines in some areas and, and what species may be contributing to that. Uh, next slide. In terms of reefs, uh, we did see a temporary reprieve in macroalgal cover right after the storm, but that's changed. And so if you look on the top left, we're starting to see um, uh, increases in species like microdictyon in some areas. Uh, there is also still evidence of uh, species of corals that have been fragmented and structural complexity um, damage, especially in reefs that are offshore, as well as those casuarina trees are still underwater and able to wreak uh, havoc should we have another really powerful storm. Um, on the positives though, uh, the evidence of cleanup in some near shore areas like Mermaid Reef is quite evident. Um, so there's minimal um, debris left there. And then some reefs like uh, the one in Sandy Key Reef here, uh, where you see the scale bar are doing relatively healthy. Um, but go to the next slide, Will. Although we didn't see stony coral tissue loss disease uh, in Abaco at the time of surveys, that's a really good thing. Uh, the same cannot be said for Grand Bahama and the reefs there are being ravaged by this disease. We're seeing high levels of coral mortality. Um, some of the species that are highly susceptible that are naturally rarer in occurrence uh, are gone um, and some species that were previously common are becoming lost and we're likely to have local extinctions on some reefs for some of these uh, important brain corals. Um, so it's really important then um, that we look at potential strategies to mitigate some of these damages um, and to help reefs recover. So I will turn it over to Will, I believe, next, who's going to take you through a deeper dive looking at some of the photogrammetry data and what, we're, what our next steps are for recovery. All right, thank you, Krista. Uh, yeah, so the technology that I have tried to bring to all of this coral reef research is photogrammetry. And essentially what that means is picking an area of coral reef and taking thousands of overlapping photos of it that you can stitch together into a really high resolution map. And you can compare those maps over time and analyze them to learn a huge amount about reef health. So we completed mosaics for all of our sites that we surveyed in October of 2019. And then again, in the exact same plots in April of 2021, this aligned time series data allows us to fate track individual corals and see whether that colony grew or died uh, or shrank or something like that. We took GPS locations for all these plots and placed underwater tags that'll allow us to find these reefs in the future and continue to monitor their recovery and, uh, and death with things like stony coral tissue loss disease. The way that I like to think about this is that these data products are like a virtual reef that you can analyze uh, perpetually that'll allow us to answer questions about what happened in the past with old data without having to go and recollect it. So it's a really powerful tool. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some examples of uh, some of the damage and impacts that Krista talked about um, and how I'm using photo mosaics photo mosaics to help look at that. Um, so in addition to getting a map like this of a reef site that lets you visually see where coral is and where it's dead and where it's healthy, it also gives us a look at the structural complexity uh, and elevation profile of each site. And that tells us a lot about the habitat quality for fish, right? Like how many hiding holes uh, and how much, how much complexity, how much structure there is there. Um, so it's, it's a really cool tool that allows us to do that. Here is an example of a reef that many of you might be familiar with. This is Mermaid Reef right off of Marsh Harbor. 
Uh, and we surveyed this one in April of 2019 before the storm. And this is what the map of the site looked like then. Here's what it looked like immediately after the storm. Uh, forgive the holes in the data. It was, it was really difficult to carry out the survey because the water still was so murky. Um, but you can see in places like this, uh, there's a ladder on the reef. There's all kinds of Kaiserina trees. We saw a lawnmower down there, an AC unit, uh, some roofing material. Um, so it allows the photo mosaic allowed us to see exactly where that was uh, and also how much coral was actually moved and damaged. Here's what that same site looked like in April of 2021. You can see that a lot of the uh, debris that was on the reef has been removed, which is amazing. Um, and overall from 2019 to 2021, you can see that a lot of the coral did manage to survive, but then also many of the colonies got physically moved around by the sheer force of the storm. Krista talked about coral bleaching. Uh, here's a site off of the north uh, the northern Abacos, where this giant colony of Orbicella faviolata was completely bleached right after the storm. Uh, and fortunately, here's that same coral in 2021, and it managed to recover with very little tissue loss, uh, which is great. And we saw that happen across a lot of sites. Um, the take home with stony coral tissue loss disease is that it's really a huge threat. Um, this is a reef from Grand Bahama that we surveyed Right, right as the disease was starting to take hold in March of 2020. Uh, and here's what that exact plot looks like in April of 2021. The red there is circling live brain coral tissue. And you can see just how much of that was lost over that year time period. So this is something that we're really concerned about. Um, and it's great that it hasn't gotten to Abaco yet, but we need to pay really close attention uh, to try to mitigate its spread. One thing I'll talk about more in the next presentation is using aerial drones to map mangroves, uh, but we've been using them and experimenting with this technology for reefs as well. I wanted to just show this slide very quickly as an example of the power of aerial imagery because you can map huge areas of reef in very, very little time. Um, and this is a, a section of a drone map using a multi-spectral camera system that allows us to map live coral cover, which you can see highlighted in red and orange in this visualization. Uh, and in the future, we hope to use this technology more and more, because you, as you can see from this image, it's, it's a really powerful way to look at what's alive and what's not. Um, so overall, we found that Hurricane Dorian had really variable impacts on reefs. Um, there was a lot of structural damage at sites that were close to the hurricane path uh, that caused a loss of structural complexity. Um, some reefs showed signs of recovery, which is great due to cleanup. Um, and especially in the Northern Bahamas, we saw some, some of that structural complexity that was lost has actually started to regrow, which is really great to see. There's still a decent amount of debris on reefs, especially casuarinas that needs to be cleaned up so it doesn't cause more damage in the future. Um, I hope that what I just showed you, the imagery gives you a sense for how important this photogrammetry and uh, mapping technology is to support ecological monitoring. So we will be doing that a lot more in the future to track how these reefs are changing through time. Um, and I think that the important thing is that the research and monitoring that we're doing continuously can help us to change our management plans and adjust strategies to inform our efforts over time. Uh, so yeah, we had a lot of folks involved in the field work for this, uh, and there's a lot of organizations to thank, uh, especially the Njari Foundation, whose boat we were on for all three of these expeditions. Um, so thank you to, to all those organizations that helped fund. Um, and I'm gonna stop this presentation there. And do you want me to go right into the next mangrove presentation? Yes, please. Okay, <laughs> great. wonderful. Okay, let me share my screen again um, and get the next set of slides up and running. And I'll start on that and then Krista will take over halfway through. All right, so Hurricane Dorian had a lot of impacts on coral reefs. Uh, and as Justin talked about earlier, it also had really devastating impacts on mangroves throughout the Little Bahama Bank. Um, there's a lot of groups that are working on the on restoring mangrove health, which is awesome because it's a monumental project. 
Uh, and so we hope to do our part in that as well. Um, the, the overarching goal of what we're trying to do is to help use science to give us a better picture of exactly what mangrove health looks like so we can help ourselves and other organizations prioritize specific areas that are really in need of restoration. Uh, in the summer of 2021, we conducted biological assessments um, at many sites all throughout the Little Bahama Bank. We conducted aerial surveys at all of them uh, using this fancy high-tech drone that I just briefly touched on in the last presentation um, that carries a high resolution camera and a, and a multi-spectral camera that can actually give us insights into specific patterns of plant health. Uh, and we also did a similar satellite mapping project to what Justin was talking about, but looking at a little bit higher resolution um, and breaking it down into patterns of destruction and how severe that destruction was that I'll talk about in a little bit. We also conducted in situ surveys underwater at 30 sites uh, using modified agra fish and benthic surveys to get a look at the health of the underwater ecosystem. We also conducted stakeholder assessments uh, and interviewed local community members to get their take on where they saw restoration as being the most important to benefit communities. Um, and several of us, and, and Justin as well, recently uh, took part in a community-based ecological mangrove restoration, CBEMR training. And we hope to apply the skills that we learned from that to do a better job of restoring mangroves to both meet ecological needs and community needs. So here's a map of all of our sites spread throughout the Little Bahama Bank. Uh, and you'll notice a few of these drone monitoring sites are actually areas that Justin and other folks have started doing restoration at. So we see these really high resolution drone maps, which are one and a half centimeter resolution uh, for the visual information, which allows us to see at the leaf level and eight centimeter resolution multispectral data. We see that as a way to, to help monitor exactly how plants are recovering or dying. Um, and we also surveyed some areas as reference conditions in Southern Abaco. Overall, we mapped 6,600 acres uh, at this really fine resolution. So as you can imagine, that's a whole lot of really, really amazing data that we will be able to resurvey in the future uh, and track exactly how these mangrove systems are recovering or not. Here's an example of what the drone data looks like at one and a half centimeter resolution. Uh, and from just from the visual part, you can see that a lot of these mangroves are dead on the right-hand side of the screen. On the left-hand side of the screen, they seem to be recovering. The multispectral data of that exact same area reveals really amazing trends. Uh, this is looking at what's called a normalized difference vegetation index that is an indicator of photosynthetic activity. And you can see that some of these areas, even on a really local scale, experience low mortality. Uh, there's some partial mortality in the middle, but then on the right-hand side of the screen, this green here indicates an area that was completely devastated. And what that's telling us is that areas that or what the drone data can help us provide is which areas actually really need restoration, which areas have no live mangroves. Um, and so you can see here, this is complete mortality. There's no living mangroves. And so that would be an area that would be prime for helping it to restore and get the ecosystem back on its feet. On the larger scale, this is, this is pretty similar to what Justin talked about earlier, uh, except that instead of just damaged or not damaged, I broke down the mangrove health into four categories and compared it from pre-storm to after the storm. Uh, and the colors in this legend here, which I'll, you'll see on the next slide, represent whether mangroves were healthy before uh, and stayed at the same level of health. Those are the green categories, or whether they were really healthy before, like those fringing tall mangroves um, and have been totally destroyed. That's what the red is showing. So here's a map of the most of Grand Bahama, um, and it reveals similar trends to what Justin was showing. There's a lot of damage along the far eastern and northern shorelines. Um, but I think what this data is really useful for is that it shows that areas like up by Water Key here in the northwestern part of Grand Bahama 
may have experienced a lot of damage, uh, but they have recovered, especially on the the areas that are farther away from the shoreline, which is which is good to see. And we hope that maps like this can help us target exactly where we need to do restoration, right? So especially thinking about these dark red areas that were heavily forested and were doing were really healthy before the storm and are mostly dead after the storm. In Abaco, the, the picture from our satellite data was a little more complex. Um, you can see the this is uh, focused on the, the marls here. Um, and some areas show really high levels of damage, but it suffers from the same problems that Justin had, where some of the really dwarf mangrove flats, like out in this area, didn't get picked up by our surveys. Um, and so there's not, it's an incomplete picture. And what it highlights is that we really need to uh, conduct in field, uh, in situ surveys to back this data up. Um, the blue that you see here is indicative of recovery, but it's just, it may actually be that it's tidal change between the satellite collection dates. Um, so it's another example of, of where we need to back that data up with in situ surveys. Overall, we hope that these satellite data can help us to look at broad trends and help us to just figure out where we should be doing work where it's most critical. Overall, we saw extreme mortality in North and East Grand Bahama. Um, like I said, the picture in the Abacos is a little more complex. The most significant damage was near the Marls in Treasure Key. Um, on a smaller scale, we found that areas near to open water or channels experience the greatest damage, which makes sense because they're the most exposed. Areas that are a little more insulated tended to survive more. Um, and we also found with the drone data that many areas that appeared to be completely dead actually did have some regrowth uh, that wasn't visible from boats. Uh, and that's, that's good news because it means that those areas are starting to recover and may not need as much help from us. Um, so I'll turn it over to Krista to finish this up. Sounds good. Thanks, Will. Um, so we're going to transition now to in water. We just had that sort of bird's eye view. Um, next slide, Will. So let's start with fish. Um, this, again, is sort of really preliminary look at some of the information um, that we have. And we have additional information that still needs to be processed. Um, as well as then comparing it to any data that we have pre-Hurricane Dorian to look at uh, before and after storm effects. Um, but for right now, we are seeing a decent amount of diversity in terms of fish communities uh, within Abaco and Grand Bahama. Sorry about the notifications. Uh, with a little bit more diversity in fish communities uh, in Grand Bahama. Across both sites, we're seeing uh, these five species here. Um, and the silver sides in particular are dominating abundances across many sites, but we're also seeing species like snappers, front and mohara, really typical um, uh, fish uh, for mangrove surveys. Um, generally speaking, fish uh, abundances were lower in some areas like Lukaya National Park um, and higher abundances in sites like East Grand Bahama where uh, we have a lot of crop root systems um, uh, from the mangroves as well. Uh, abundances of, of species like uh, groupers, on the other hand, were low across both islands and we didn't see any lionfish. Next slide, Will. Um, in, in terms of uh, benthic assessments, um, Stephanie talked about uh, seagrass uh, earlier, if you go to the next, Will. Um, so just looking at the percentage of the different seagrass here for Grand Bahama, it was mixed across sites. We had some sites where we didn't see any seagrass in the, benth uh, the benthic transect surveys, but they were primarily dominated by turtle grass, the Thalassia and next, Will. And then for Abaco, again, a few sites where no seagrass was, was found. Um, and then one site um, in Abaco here where we are seeing impacts of the storm and uh, that shoal grass, Halajuli righty, um, being dominant there. So go next, Will. Uh, so overall, across both islands, this turtle grass is still the dominant seagrass, showing relatively minimal damage, at least for the benthic communities uh, for seagrass for both Grand Bahama and Abaco. Next. Um, and go next again. Yeah. Um, so looking at the benthic cover, um, again, variability across sites um, in terms of what we're seeing, 
whether it's fleshy, the different uh, fleshy macroalgae or calcareous macroalgae um, for Gram Bahama, but primarily Botophora. And next, Will. Um, and then the same patterns for Abaco, but we're not seeing some species like Acetabularia in the yellow, uh, but again, Batophora uh, is dominating here. Um, and across both areas, a low prevalence of both corals um, and other inverts uh, in these mangrove benthic surveys. Next. Uh, in terms of stakeholder assessments that Will talked about, um, these were done with respondents um, from both islands uh, in Grand Bahama and Abaco to look at where they felt, uh, which areas they felt should be prioritized for restoration. Uh, most of the responses that we got did come back from people uh, in Abaco, and they identified eight priority areas for restoration, including the three that are in orange there. Uh, I think it's Green Turtle Key, Man War, and Elbow Key. Um, but if you go uh, next, Will, yeah. Um, and then did the same sort of assessment for, for Grand Bahama, where they've identified 12 areas here um, uh, that are important to them for restoration, uh, with the ones in orange highlighted um, as highly important for them. But you'll notice, if you recall Will's maps earlier, there is a difference between what we're seeing with the ecological data and with the areas that respondents are identifying as some of the priority areas for them. For example, for Green Turtle Key, uh, restoration is not necessarily something that's important. Um, there appears to be significant natural regrowth, uh, which you can see in this aerial drone photo here. Um, and it's one of the largest mangrove areas. On the other hand, if you look at places like um, uh, Lukaya National Park in Abaco, that era we, we primarily saw really minimal damage um, to the mangrove ecosystems. They're relatively healthy. And conversely, East Grand Bahama here where we saw major damage is not an area that was identified um, by stakeholders. So it really highlights um, you know, that there are potential opportunities for us to to marry and have synergies between what the social science says and what the ecological data says and to compromise so that we have functional uh, mangrove ecosystems that continue to provide benefit to the communities that depend on them. Next slide, Will. And uh, next, yeah. So moving forward, we'll be expanding our work with with additional satellite imagery using more robust data sets, uh, conducting additional in-water and aerial surveys um, to better track uh, recovery, um, as, especially once restoration kicks off. And we already talked about um, some of the work that's been done to kind of get partners up to speed with best restoration techniques so that we're incorporating that in um, to plans moving forward. Um, one of the good things, at least initially based on the assessments that we have so far, is that uh, although our benthic and fish communities appear to be relatively healthy for now, um, and that's a good thing uh, because those root systems are intact. Unfortunately, if you remember from a lot of those air, uh, images, uh, those trees are dead on the top and quite fragile and brittle. So these ecosystems are really vulnerable and restoration is definitely something that's needed. And so we're really excited to continue working with partners to support uh, coordinated restoration for the Little Bahama Bank. And next slide, Will. So I just wanna thank everyone that's been involved uh, with this project, um, uh, as well as all of the funding agencies that are involved, the community members that participated in virtual um, uh, surveys and providing their input, as well as Sherwin and Livingston Tate that were amazing guides um, for the work that we did in East from Bahama. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you guys for your presentations, that was great. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we are halfway through our Abaco Science Alliance Conference. Thank you again for being here. Um, just wanna say we will address questions and answers at the end. Um, and if you have one during a presentation, you can go ahead and type it in the Q&A box um, on the bottom of your screen. I'm just going to launch a couple polls before we move on, um, just to see who we have here in attendance who might be new to ASAC and also who you may be representing. So if you would follow along with the polls, please.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you everyone for particip participating in our polls. Up next, we have Dr. Sean Geary, who is an evolutionary ecologist currently at Penn State University. He has been conducting ecological research on Avoco since 2009. His research focuses on understanding how variation arises within species and how that variation can influence ecological processes. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Can you see uh, a lizard holding on to a dowel? Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to share some initial results from some work that I've been doing over the last several years. Um, and uh, very excited to actually be back at ASAC. It's, 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 it's wonderful to, to be back and listen to some of the great work that's happening here and, and the role that Friends is playing in facilitating all of this. So th thank you. All right, so before I get into the specifics of sort of Hurricane Dorian, I just wanna introduce the sort of study system that, uh, that this work that I'm gonna be talking about today is conducted in. People that, well, People are pretty familiar with Snake Key here on the east coast or the central east coast of um, Abaco Island. And if you've ever been to, to Snake Key, it's a beautiful area. Um, it's sort of a shallow inland tidal creek. And within that sort of shallow extent of water, which is only maybe a meter to two meters deep on average, there are just hundreds of these tiny little islands. Um, and that really, um, it's, it's really a wonderful place to, to kayak and boat around. These islands are really variable in size and shape and height. Um, some of the smallest islands you can see here on the upper left are, you know, get, get pretty crowded if you tried to have a picnic on them. Um, where some of the larger islands are, you know, um, maybe about the size of a footprint of a good sized house or something like that. A lot of the islands are actually also really low. So you'll see here on the bottom, left, there are islands that are maybe about a meter or even maybe a little less um, above the mean high tide level, whereas other islands are a little bit higher. Um, here on the bottom right, that's me standing on top of an island. It's one of our, our larger islands or higher islands that's, that's a little bit more than three meters above the mean high tide. So this is just to give you an idea of how much variation there is among these different islands and sort of size and, and height. What's really cool about these islands is that they're covered with these very simple ecological communities. If you've ever been onto one of these islands, they're, they're really sort of wonderful subsets of the, the Abaco community in general. Um, here is a pretty typical island um, showing a really scrubby vegetation, mostly things like buttonwood and some grasses and sedges. Um, but it's all really pretty low stature vegetation, very simple. On a lot of these islands, the, the dominant sort of predator, or the, the top predator is the brown and all, which again, you're probably very familiar with. It's about a, a small lizard about the size of your finger. And they're incredibly tolerant of sort of hot and dry conditions. Um, and they're just a wonderful little study organism uh, that really is the focus of a lot of the work that's been happening on these island ecosystems. These islands are part of a long-term uh, project that's been going on since the, I believe the 70s. So we have about 30 plus years of ecological data from these various islands. Um, and while there's various projects that have been happening over the years, more or less, there has been a steady effort towards an annual census of some basic ecological data. So we do mark and recapture um, censuses for the brown and alls. We also look at how much these buttonwood bushes or trees grow during you know, the year. We also look at how much herbivore damage there is to the leaves of these buttonwood bushes. And then we also do 
spider surveys for the different species of spiders, um, how many there are, and sort of how high their, their webs are up off the ground. For the lizards, we actually collect a little bit more data as well. Some of these are only, we only have maybe 10 or 15 years of, but we have a little bit more resolution for the lizards. So every year when we go to these islands, we collect data on habitat use. That is like, where are they on these, you know, what kind of habitat are they? They using? Are they all running around on the ground? Or are they up in the bushes using twigs and branches, um, you know, a meter high or so? We also collect as many lizards as we can from these little islands. We take them back to the field lab or hotel room, whatever we have, and we actually use a portable x-ray machine and we take individual x-rays of every individual we catch. We try to get every individual in each population. We can use these x-rays to measure morphology. So how long are their legs? Um, how wide is their head? How long are they? And so on and so forth. So we collect x-rays from every individual in the population if we can. Over the last 10, 15 years, we've also been using flatbed scanners to collect an additional uh, set of data. Um, these are basically directed towards trying to understand the morphology of the feet. In particular, we're interested in, under, in looking at the number of lamellae. Lamellae are these sort of flat, uh, sticky scales at the tips of their, the lizard's toes that help them sort of stick on to things, right? So uh, I'll talk about them a little bit later. Uh, so this is another bit of data that we get from every lizard we, we, we catch. You can see here, this one is K100. Um, it also has a little tag on its thigh that helps us ID it. Um, but this is a pretty normal uh, set of data that we collect every year. So because we collect these data every year as part of this long-term project, we can start to ask questions, you know, when strange things happen or maybe when th strange things don't happen. For example, we can ask questions about what are the effects of hurricanes on these island ecosystems. Um, and I'll just stop here briefly to, to point out that this is a collaborative project um, that we, we got funded through NSF to look at the effects of Hurricane Dorian. And, and while um, we have quite a few different questions that we're looking at, I'm really just gonna be talking about a very small subset of what we have ongoing. Um, and we'll be, you know, we're gonna be working on this for the next year or two at least. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea of where Snake Key is in, rel in relation to Hurricane Dorian. This cartoon I put together basically shows you the location of Snake Key. You can see that white box there is the approximate location of the study system I was talking about before with all those small islands. Um, using some modeling data, we can estimate that the max sustained winds in this area were about 150 miles an hour. Um, so pretty extreme, not as extreme as some other places, but still uh, pretty strong winds. And then, you know, we can expect that there were at least 70 to 100 mile an hour winds. Uh, that lasted for you know quite a few hours at least. Um, interestingly, from the work that we do on the ground, it doesn't look like there was much of a storm surge. Um, you know, the 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 winds coming out of the west, I think, really reduced the amount of storm surge in this area south of the eye. Um, as part of this project, we resurveyed as many islands as we could um, in March 2000. 20. Um, we matched these up against data that we had from May 2019. Um, but on our, our March 2020 uh, visit, you know, it was really apparent, even though this is six months after, there's a lot of damage uh, to the vegetation on these islands. This is just sort of a typical island in the middle of Snake Key. You can see lots of damage to the vegetation, lots of erosion. You know, there's essentially no uh, soil. There's not much soil on these islands anyways, but whatever was there was more or less washed away or blown away. And then some, you know, the rocks get disheveled and blown apart. Um, so lots of evidence of pretty strong disturbance. A lot of this looked like uh, water, but a tremendous amount of this damage actually looks like wind as well. Here's a, an island that's maybe two and a half meters high. This rock weighs, I don't know, less than 100 pounds, but more than you want to pick up. And this is pretty common. We'd see large rocks like this blowing all over these islands. We didn't expect to see too many lizards on these islands when we got back there in March, but thankfully, a lot of these lizards did actually manage to persist. 
And so uh, even though there was pretty high um, rates of extinction for islands, about half of the islands actually had lizard populations that persisted through the storm. Um, and among those islands that uh, persisted, about 50% survived. So pretty severe impacts, but we did see pretty good survivorship. This made us wonder, okay, what's it like for to be a little lizard that's uh, you know, a couple grams and 100 mile an hour winds or 150 mile an hour winds? These videos of a lizard sort of exposed to a leaf blower uh, done by a collaborator of mine, Colin Donahue, give us an idea of what conditions these lizards might experience during a storm. They also illustrate what might make the difference between a lizard that persists on an island and a lizard that doesn't. And if you watch these videos, you'll see that those front forelimbs seem to be really important for sort of maintaining a grip on, in this case, it's just a wooden dowel, but it's pretty close to a mangrove branch or a buttonwood branch. It actually makes sense that these traits are, are important. We can look at the functional morphology literature and see that lizards with longer limbs actually have better clinging force. It actually takes more force to remove a long-legged lizard from a wooden dowel than it does a short-legged lizard. So long-legged lizards actually tend to cling better. We can also look at those lamellae, that those sort of sticky scales on the feet. We can also see evidence that the more lamellae an individual has, the better its ability to cling to whatever substrate it's hanging onto. And so we can come up with a couple predictions about the difference between this, you know, what would be the traits of the individuals that survived this hurricane? And so we came up with some predictions that after the hurricane, lizards should have longer limbs because they're better able to cling to narrow branches. And they should also have larger toe pads or toe pads with more lamellae. In this plot, we show the results for the forelimb lengths of female lizards from Snake Key. Each pair of plots represents an island. On the left side is the, is the population mean before the hurricane. On the right side is that same population after the hurricane. All right, so these are, these are limb lengths after we correct, correct for body size. So this is sort of like the relative limb length for an individual lizard uh, mean across the whole population. But what you'll see here is that each one of these populations shows an increase in the population mean limb length after the hurricane. All right, so what's happening here presumably is that those short limbed lizards are getting blown off these islands because they're not able to hold on or cling to the branches effectively as predicted. And you'll also see that there's a very consistent directional change in these islands. When we look at the the towpad data, we see more or less the same pattern. We see populations increase in the mean number of lamellae that they have on their feet. Presumably, again, those individuals with low numbers of lamellae that have reduced the ability to hang on get blown off the islands and Lord knows where they go. So again, we see strong directional selection for, uh, uh, for cling performance in these lizard populations. So the main question we will try to answer here is what did lizard treats change to the natural selection? It looks like, yes, that lizards that survived Dorian had longer limbs and stickier toes. And we're gonna be going back and continuing to track these populations over time to see if those differences actually persist. And if we saw sort of evolutionary change due to Dorian. And of course, this is work that was, you know, not directly supported by, uh, sort of people, uh, undergraduates and people in Amico, uh, but essentially this is part of a program that's relied heavily on uh, lots of help across the years. And so um, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Up next, we have Diane Claridge, PhD, a native Bahamian, <laughs> whom is the executive director of the Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization, which is a local NGO based in Sandy Point, Abaco, that conducts 
conservation-driven research on marine mammals and educational outreach. Her research focus is on population ecology of whales and dolphins providing information on the status of local populations. She has been a longtime board member of Friends of the Environment, serves on the Bahamas National Trust's Scientific Advisory Board, and continues to be active in conservation in the Bahamas. Diane is a research fellow at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, where she co-supervises undergraduate and graduate students. Okay, can you see my uh, slides and um, hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, thanks, uh, thanks for the intro, uh, Lindisha, and also a great shout out to Friends of the Environment for, for pulling us together. And um, even though we're, we're not in the same room, I think um, this format is, is still so important and, and ASAC is, is uh, such a great opportunity for us um, working in the Bahamas to be able to share our work with, uh, with students here and community members as well. So I'm gonna be talking to you about um, work we've been doing on coastal bottlenose dolphins in Abaco. This is a, a study to monitor the population status of animals um, in Abaco that started in the, in the early 1990s. And um, uh, we've been able to, to uh, determine how well that population is doing. And um, unfortunately, they're not doing very well. And some of the reason for that is because of their, um, the effects of climate change um, on these top predators. And right now we're uh, building a program to um, increase the resilience to the impacts of climate change by, by um, reducing the other types of impacts that, um, that are the result of human activities. Um, and so I'm gonna be uh, sharing some of that with you today, as well as uh, the results, uh, initial results of our post-Orient um, assessments of this population. So just a little bit of background. Um, bottlenose dolphins or Terceps truncatus are, uh, are um, part of our um, marine megafauna here in the Bahamas, but there's two different types. There's a coastal ecotype and oceanic ecotype. Um, and uh, these animals, uh, although they are still described as the same species, they're, um, they're genetically diverged about, uh, well, at least uh, 100,000 years ago, so they're not interbreeding. If, um, and in Abaco, you can find the coastal ecotype um, on the Little Bahama Bank in the shallow water systems um, and the oceanic type out in the Atlantic. And um, one of the, the um, adaptations that the, the coastal type have made is uh, they're smaller in body size, but they also look different. Their pectoral fins are, are um, much larger, shown by the arrows there relative to their oceanic cousins. Um, and this allows them to, to um, survive better and hunt for fish that might be hiding around a rock, rocky ledge or, or coral reefs. And so they're maneuvering in, um, in smaller spaces, whereas their oceanic guys are out there in, in the deep open oceans. Um, so just uh, important to note from a conservation perspective that um, the dolphins that are on Little Bahama Bank are not part of the same populations that are found out offshore in the Atlantic. Um, there's been quite a bit of work uh, studying bottlenose dolphins on Little Bahama Bank. Um, there's a group uh, or several groups that have worked in the north, northwestern part of the bank, um, north of Grand Bahama. And then um, along with collaborators from NOAA Fisheries, uh, we've been doing work here in Abaco. Um, both in the Marsh Harbor area, the Sea of Abaco community, and, um, and down here based in Sandy Point in South Abaco. And um, along with our colleagues, we've um, learned that the dolphins on, on Little Bahama Bank, um, as I mentioned, they're not interacting with their oceanic counterparts, um, but they're also not swimming across these uh, deep water channels to the Southern Bahamas. So Little Bahama Bank dolphins are a different uh, population to those on Great Bahama Bank. Um, and then within the Little Bahama Bank system, they're, they're uh, isolated even further into these communities. Um, so you have resident um, populations of dolphins that remain within certain limited areas. Um, so the dolphins from the Sea of Abaco community are different to the dolphins um, from the South Abaco community. It's kind of like if you're from Sandy Point, um, that's a long drive up to Marsh Harbor. So you spend most of your time down here in Sandy Point and, and, and uh, vice versa. Um, the dolphins in, in, uh, around Marsh Harbor are rarely coming down to, uh, to Sandy Point. 
Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, focusing on the Sea of Abaco um, community. So within the Sea of Abaco, uh, bottlenose dolphins are um, some of the top predators. They're not the apex predator, um, but uh, nonetheless, they're really important in maintaining the stability of the marine trophic pyramid as shown here. Um, and you can think of this pyramid as sort of like a house. Um, each level or layer within um, the stability of the entire structure. If you um, remove a, a layer of bricks in your house, the house is uh, going to become unstable and eventually it's going to collapse. And the same is uh, true for these marine ecosystems. Um, so maintaining healthy bottlenose dolphin populations is critical to, um, to uh, maintaining the stability of our marine ecosystems here in Abaco. So how do we study these animals? Well, um, it's uh, we've, using a, a very simple approach. We uh, have a good camera, get out on the water, um, take photographs of individuals. Um, and much like uh, what Sean just talked about with the uh, mark recapture work with, uh, with lizards, um, we're not actually capturing these animals physically, we're just capturing them photographically. Um, and by doing that, we can um, monitor the population trends. So we have catalogs of individuals that are photographed each year. Um, we can keep track of, of who's still alive, who's perhaps died or left the area. And um, of the ones here, have they had babies? Have the babies survived? And over time, you can look at the, the um, status of the population or trends. Is it increasing? Is it stable? Or is it declining? And sadly, for the Sea of Abaco dolphin community, um, we've shown that it has been declining. And that decline started um, at the, in the late 1990s. Uh, this is work that was done by a PhD student almost 10 years ago. And already, um, the Sea of Abaco, the number of dolphins using the Sea of Abaco had declined by about half is the number that uh, um, initially used the area when we began the work in the early 1990s. So that's what's shown by the black line there, this um, very clear decline in the number of animals. And it's the result of um, more animals dying, the red bars there, than um, are being recruited to the population through births. So not as many uh, dolphins being born. And we understand why this, um, as you know, these top predators have struggled to, uh, to uh, make it in the Sea of Abaco over the last 30 years. And it's because the area has, has been uh, subjected to uh, quite a, a, a lot of changes, anthropomorphic changes, um, <clears throat> such as uh, coastal development. So lots of new marinas in place. Um, all of those bring more boats and the boats get bigger and faster and more engines. And so they're making a lot more noise out there. Everybody wants to go out fishing. So there's more fishing um, pressure on our marine resources. Um, local fishing as well has increased. And some of those uh, resources have um, been overfished as well as increased uh, pollution just because there's more people using the area. Um, so basically the area has become more polluted, noisy and overfished and the quality of the habitat just isn't what it was 30 years ago. And we believe that the dolphins are, are not using the area as much. They're, there's better, higher quality habitat north of the Sea of Abaco. So like uh, Green Turtle Key area and north, there aren't as many people in boats and marinas up there. Um, or even uh, we've had an increase in the number of sightings down, um, down in the Cherokee area. Um, but by far, we believe that the change in the dolphin population um, is because of the increased number of hurricanes and tropical storms over the past 30 years. Um, and this has accelerated the, the rate of decline in, in the habitat quality. But as, as individual Bahamians, um, you know, there's only so much that we can do to slow that uh, the rate of, of uh, um, climate change. So we want to focus our efforts um, in trying to save this pop population of dolphins um, in Abaco um, on uh, changing those things that we can do, the human activities that we have some control over. So um, maybe slowing down coastal development and the number of boats in the area and fishing. So we wanna reduce the impacts of these other types of um, um, human disturbances. Um, the work that we've done since Dorian um, has been uh, very enlightening. Um, we've been out on the water 36 days, um, 
uh, and have had some great interns out with us. Um, any of you students, if you're interested in getting involved, we have funding to continue this work and are looking for interns um, this spring and summer. Um, the black dots there show where we sighted dolphins. So we've seen them all throughout the area um, where they've been found historically. But um, 36 days isn't a lot of time on the water. And so um, what we did early on was place these acoustic recorders in uh, strategic locations. Um, there, you can see Charlotte there with a the recorder in her hand. She's getting ready to take it down and secure it to the sea floor. Um, and the recorders are recording basically 24 seven. So they're giving us information on all of the noises that um, that, that recorder is detecting, um, which includes the dolphins clicks and whistles. So if dolphins are in the area, we have a really good chance of, of recording their presence, um, as well as the background noise. And I've talked a bit about boats and, and noise. Uh, Charlotte's gonna get into that in, in her talk um, more and sort of the impacts that that has on, on marine mammals. but. But basically when Hurricane Dorian came through, the, um, the marinas and boats were destroyed. And what was a noisy environment, once the storm passed, essentially became quiet. And so we predicted that dolphins would, if they survived the storms, the storm themselves, um, they might return to the Sea of Abaco as it was suddenly um, uh, not such a, a bad place to be if you're a dolphin. And that's actually what we've seen. Um, the graph at the top um, shows in the, the black line there is the distance that we had to travel during our vessel surveys in order to find a dolphin in the Sea of Abaco. And, and right after the storm in November of 2019, we had to travel almost 120 kilometers to find a single dolphin. And as time has passed since the storm, because there's more dolphins in the area, we don't have to go near as far. And, and that's really great. Um, and uh, we've seen some in the photo ID work, we, we've uh, shown that there's some animals that, uh, old animals that were seen in the early 1990s that, that have made it through the storm. Um, and that's also great. But one of the most encouraging things is that uh, we're now seeing a lot of young, uh, young dolphins, new calves that were born since the storm. Um, and that's what's shown in the red line here on the graph. So we didn't have any, any uh, calves in the beginning um, following the storm, but in the last two, times that we've been out uh, doing dedicated survey work, uh, the number of calves is just increasing. And, and that's our challenge now is to, is to maintain um, the habitat quality that can, um, uh, can sustain uh, these females that are, that are reproductively active and doing better and having calves and so that these calves have a chance to, to survive. And, but there's a, there's a bit of, um, um, it, it's not all, uh, uh, bright light. Um, there, it's not unexpected that that we would see an increase in re reproduction rates in a population that's been disturbed, because some females during the storm would have lost their calf, or if they're pregnant, maybe uh, aborted. Um, so they would become reproductively active um, quite quickly afterwards. And so some of these animals probably um, ha have had that experience. And so there's a higher number of reproductively um, active females within the area than there would have been normally. Um, and uh, that's that's expected following storms. But also what's happened, um, for example, off of um, you know, in after Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, because of the fishing fleet was destroyed, there were more fish available to dolphins. So the reproductive rate also increased because there, the dolphins had more food available um, and in a better condition to be able to, uh, to rear calves. So that may be what's happening in the Sea of Abaco as well. But whatever it is, we need to uh, do what we can to maintain um, the health of, of these animals. Um, the bottom two graphs show the results of the acoustic recorders, or two of the three recorders. Um, the one on the left there is at point set, which is in the most pristine of those areas. Um, and the dolphin, the probability of detecting dolphins is shown on the y-axis, and the time is on the x-axis, so the number of days since the storm. This was work that was done by a, a grad student at University of St. Andrews. It's actually only through the first 200 days after the storm, but you can see um, it supports what we found in the visual surveys that the number of dolphins detections increased with time after Dorian, uh, suggesting that dolphins are returning to the area. But unfortunately, um, when we look at the Marsh Harbor um, probability of detections, we can see by January 2020, 
um, that rate of uh, detections is already declining. And that coincides with um, the time when the, when the uh, restoration work was really just kicking in. Um, so there were a lot of freight boats coming in, uh, barges moving debris off the islands, coming into Marsh Harbor. This, this recorder is right outside of, of the port of Marsh Harbor. Um, so already dolphins are, um, we believe, potentially beginning to avoid the noisiest areas within the Sea of Abaco. And, and so what we can do with this information is, is identify which areas are not the noisiest and make sure that we protect those areas. Um, and that's exactly uh, the sort of information that we're putting into our recovery plan. Um, this is very much a community-based program, um, and we invite everybody in Abaco to, to become part of it. Um, there is a lot that we can do individually to help with the recovery. Um, I think one of the most important things right now is to support our marine protected areas. If, uh, if you're a fisherman or no fisherman, um, encourage them to uh, leave those areas alone. Um, uh, great work that Friends of the Environment has done to, to establish these, these sites and and uh, from some of the talks earlier today, we know that some of these areas actually did quite well after the storm or are recovering um, if they were impacted. And um, so it's real important to maintaining um, or restoring the, the stability of that marine trophic pyramid um, by protecting the habitats that, that did survive. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know, uh, who of you are familiar with Pot Cake? Um, he's a, a, our local oracle um, in Nassau, um, but he reminds us that climate change is real and, and we all need to do our part. Um, um, become a, if you love dolphins, become an advocate, uh, speak up for their protection and um, do what we can to, to help uh, save the Sea of Abaco dolphins. So our goal as part of the recovery plan is a healthier Sea of Abaco, which is good for all of us who live here. Um, and will result in more dolphin births. Um, the calf that's shown here on Tulu Bank, and um, she was born just after Hurricane Dorian, um, survived through the, the first year. Um, we need to do our part to make sure that this little guy has a chance to make it um, and become a mom herself. And uh, invite you to become part of, of the solution. And to learn more, you can follow us at BIMRO on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and on our website too. And uh, this is a long-term study, so uh, lots of lots of folks to um, to thank. But in particular, um, those from the BEP Foundation, the Devereux Ocean Foundation, and the Bahamas Protective Area Fund, um, who uh, funded the work most recently. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Diane. That was awesome. Up next, we have Charlotte Dunn, who co-runs the Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization based in Sandy Point, Abaco. She is a bioacoustician and her PhD is focused on beaked whale communication. <laughs> okay, getting that, getting that. <laughs> okay. Okay, is that big screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, um, I think they always put me on before lunch, keep everyone awake. Um, so I'm going to talk about not the catastoric catastrophic event of Dorian, but that was the beginning of something here that continued during COVID, which basically was um, a pause in human activity in the ocean. So um, an anthropause aquatic, um, Dorian wiped out a lot of ship noise here and COVID continued that. Um, so I just wanna talk about how that affected us. Um, I study sound in the ocean, so this talk is focused on sound. Um, maybe at New Year's, 
Maybe your parents danced to that. Maybe you danced to this. But the point is that sound is everywhere. You don't even think about it, but all the time, like right now, um, maybe your dog's barking, or if you're in NAS, or maybe your generator's on. Um, but there's sound constantly around you. And we, it triggers memories for us, it triggers threats, it triggers um, actions, but we never think about how much sound is important under the water. Um, so I don't just study sound, I study it relative to um, marine mammals. And marine mammals use sound for everything. And that's because once you go beyond 200 meters depth in the ocean, there is no light that travels beyond that depth. So they need sound to um, find their food, to find each other, to figure out where they are, and also um, to listen, to listen to um, any threats, whether a ship's about to hit them, or um, whether there's a predator around. So their whole environment depends on being able to hear. Um, if you can hear these clicks, what that is, is this very, very young sperm whale calves mother is a thousand meters below it and she is finding food. She's left this young baby with probably a teenage sister um, at the surface to babysit. And she's the mother is making a click. And when the click hits a squid, the echo comes back and tells her how far away it is, what kind of squid it is, etc. And these two will follow her click. So when she surfaces, they'll rejoin her. Um, they can hear her clicks because in in that place where they were, there was not much um, ship noise. The other thing there is what I talked about was listening for threats, and that can be a ship or else this is in Andrus um, in 2019. We have killer whales in the Bahamas pretty much every year, um, and they do sometimes make sound. So it's important for marine mammals to be able to hear, hear that kind of threat as well. That was so cool. Um, okay, so here's a sperm whale and some squid that it may be looking to find and also a beaked whale. Um, beaked whales use the same form of clicking. If ship noise keeps getting louder, then, then basically it's making their environment unfeasible. They can't hear their clicks coming back, so they won't be able to find food. Um, Blue whales use uh, those kind of low moans that you probably recognize um, from whale sounds. Um, I'm sort of on the edge of trying to pretend to do one, but I don't think I will. Um, but anyway, in the last 50 years, the space that a blue whale can hear another blue whale, which used to be from one side of the Atlantic to the other, that's communication space has reduced by 90%. So that is solely from increasing ship traffic. So what is the effects of um, sound on marine mammals? Well, basically this um, animal was in Grand Bahama in the 2000 stranding here that was due to a extreme Navy sonar exercise. So when an immediate um, event like that happens, the whales will, will strand on the beach and may die. Um, but otherwise, over time, they could suffer from hearing impairment, which will affect all those life functions that I talked about. Um, changes in vocalization, so having to uh, talk louder or change the pitch of, of how they speak. Um, and also having to, having to move. So in Andrus, where, where we work um, studying the Navy sonar, when the submarines arrive, the, the whales leave. And when the submarines leave, the whales return. The other um, known fact is that whales have more physiological stress in areas of more noise. But all of those changes, change your vocalization or moving area, 
um, particularly require more energy. And if you're using more energy, you're less fit as an individual, and that will in time uh, affect the population. So we began a study in 2017. You can see on the right is the Atlantic and on the left is America. And these are ship uh, tracks and where it's red, there are more ships. And so the ships come from Europe around the southern end of Abaco to America, maybe stop in Freeport on the way. Um, we know we've been studying here for three decades, this is a nursery ground for sperm whales. So female sperm whales and their young live here their entire lives. And we wanted to understand how the overlap of sperm whale habitat and increasing ship traffic, um, how that was affecting the sperm whales. And, and think of some kind of mitigation strategies to suggest to government. So then COVID happened, well, Dorian and then COVID, and basically ship behavior changed. First, a lot of our local boats were gone. And then what happened is the supply chain globally completely broke down. And the effect of that basically was that ships slowed down because ports could not handle um, the traffic mainly because of different COVID protocols. So I want to show you um, just a quick video on the study that we did focused on COVID. Our oceans are full of different sounds. Without even knowing it, we are adding so much unnatural noise. As Bahamians, we rely on a healthy marine environment. Ocean noise affects all marine species, all marine life. The ships that were here during COVID were going about two knots slower. The noise is reduced by 41%. A slowdown of these ships has made for a quieter ocean here in the Bahamas. So we did publish these results last year. Um, the key to take away here is that the opportunity COVID gave us was potentially we may have suggested to government look, there's a really high overlap here of ships and sperm whales. We know that when ships go slower, they're quieter. Let's perhaps have a slowdown zone, you know, just in these two miles. Um, but we wouldn't have known the effect of that, but now we do. So now when we say to government, we know if we make a slowdown zone here, it's going to have a massive effect. And it's not just for whales. Um, we know that commercial fish species and, and all marine species are affected now by noise. So, so this was an amazing opportunity. Um, and recently there has also been um, a publication of whale superhighways. Um, and that's, you know, that's exactly what we need to do. It's globally, we're mapping the whale highways and the ship highways and and we are going to be able to now put in some mitigation um strategies globally but we have this great study now in the bahamas to show how effective uh slowing down can be yeah i think that's it so thanks again to our funders and uh i think i've left bradley a little bit of time Thank you, Charlotte. Up next, we have Bradley Watson. Bradley is an environmental scientist and sustainable development professional who helped organize the Bahamas National Trust's terrestrial surveys and outreach activities after Hurricane Dorian. 
His expertise lies in plants and avian ecology, and he is currently completing a master's in sustainable development to add to his master's degree in biology. Upon completing his studies as a Chevening scholar, Bradley plans to integrate biodiversity conservation with sustainable development to help the Bahamas develop a climate change resilient society that benefits from and protects its natural resources. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, please give me one moment. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bradley Watson, and thank you, Lindisha and Liana, for the introduction and uh, for everybody at Friends for organizing this conference. So today we're going to talk about biodiversity conservation, climate resilience, and sustainable development uh, using the terrestrial surveys that we did after Hurricane Dorian as an example of how we can kind of frame our responses to these natural disasters and biodiversity conservation in general uh, through a lens of sustainable development to increase climate resilience and, and doing that through building communities as well as building healthy ecosystems. So I represent the Bahamas National Trust and our vision is to have a comprehensive network of effectively managed Bahamian national parks and protected areas that's recognized as a powerful force for global biodiversity conservation, which is supported and enjoyed by the public. And that last bit of the, the mission statement that we have is kind of where this topic, this, this conversation is gonna lean into as we think about conservation as an act of sustainable development. So the ecosystem we're focusing on today are the pine lands of the Bahamas. Uh, we have three pine islands. Uh, Nassau used to have an extensive area of pine land and it is considered a pine island. So there are four pine islands, but a lot of the pine forest in Nassau has been removed and New Providence has been removed. And so we have Andros with extensive pine forests. And then we have Grand Bahama and Abaco with extensive pine forests that have been hit by Hurricane Dorian. And a lot of that pine area has been removed. And so the species that we're gonna focus on today are birds. Uh, if we consider the Bahama warbler, this is an endemic species that is only found in the Bahamas and it's only found on Grand Bahama and Abaco. And this is the bird that motivated a lot of our work after Hurricane Dorian. We were aware that if we consider the Bahama nuthatch, which is a bird that is only found in pine, pine lands, just like the Bahama warbler, but it was extirpated from Grand Bahama in 2018. And so we've had so many hurricanes hit Grand Bahama and remove so much pine land habitat that this bird is no longer seen there. And that means that we've lost an entire species. The entire world has lost a species because of hurricane damage. And a lot of this hurricane damage is motivated by global climate change, increasing the frequency of these storms. And so when we recognize the similarities between the plight of the Bahama nuthatch that we already lost and the plight of the Bahama warbler, we saw it as extremely important to go in and survey the populations of birds on Grand Bahama and Abaco after Hurricane Dorian. So what is a pine forest ecosystem and what's so unique about them? If you look at this system here, you can see that there are multiple levels to the system. You have the understory, the midstory, and then the canopy area. And birds use each of these parts of the system for different reasons. Uh, this is a drone shot of the Abaco National Park in South Abaco. And this area was mostly untouched after Hurricane Dorian. In contrast, we have this pine forest in Grand Bahama. You can note that trees died. Lots of these trees died due to saltwater intrusion that compromise their root systems and their availability, ability to access water. Um, after the storm, we also had lots of debris on the ground and material that would feed fires. And so we had fires that took out a lot of other uh, pine trees and other uh, vegetation. You can note that there is the understory coming in and lots of that is palms. And those are species that are much more easily adaptable to these hurricanes. And so one of the challenges we have is that uh, if we have this high frequency of hurricane activity that these pine forests are not adapted to cope with, they're gonna transition into a state where we have more coppice habitats as opposed to pine land habitats. And that means we would lose habitat for these species that have evolved in the Bahamas and have reached their, their species status and are our endemic species. And so it's imperative that we conserve these pine habitats. What did we do after Hurricane Dorian? 
we conducted avian diversity assessments. The first assessment we did was for Bahama parrots, and uh, we got down to Abaco in October after the storm. So very shortly after the storm, we were still watching trees respond to the hurricane damage. And in coppice areas, we were just beginning to see flowers begin to emerge again, because trees will do this. Coppice habitats typically respond very quickly after a, after a storm, while pine land habitats take a lot longer if they respond at all. So in Abaco, we returned uh, in December 2019 to do surveys of the resident species during that winter. There were also uh, migratory species that came in, but we did not include those in our measures here. We also visited Grand Bahama in February of 2020 do similar surveys using the same methods to look for Bahama, nut, Bahama warblers and potentially Bahama nut hatches. So here we have a map of Abaco and the data that we're going to discuss in this presentation is mostly taken from our surveys in Abaco. We conducted point count surveys in both coppice and pine habitats because we wanted to see how these communities responded after the storm. We distributed our transects so that we had sites that were in the path of the storm and sites that were not in the path of the storm, uh, allowing us to compare you know, the effects of hurricane damage on these habitats. We followed the methods used by Stedman and Franklin in a 2011 study of both pine and coppice habitats. And this allowed us to make comparisons between a year where there was a severe storm to a year where there was no severe storm activity. We compared the numbers and types of bird birds found in 2011 to those found right after Hurricane Dorian. The data that we will consider today is survey data that was collected in disturbed pine habitats, so habitats where there was storm activity, and disturbed coppice habitats, and comparing that to the undisturbed pine and coppice habitats where there was no storm activity. The biggest take home from that work was that Pine habitats had greatly reduced uh, abundance of birds compared to coppice habitats. And so, like I said before, we note that in coppice habitats, because of the rapid speed of regrowth, these habitats support very similar numbers of birds after a storm as they did before a storm, compared to a pine habitat where you basically lose most of your bird abundance. In fact, we found mostly uh, pine warblers which are a more uh, opportunist species compared to a Bahama warbler that is a very pine specific species. So after we did these surveys and we noted that we had nearly no observations of Bahama warblers in Grand Bahama, none reported since Hurricane Dorian up to now, we moved quickly to recommend that the Bahama warbler be named an endangered species. And so through our observations, as well as observations of other scientists, we were able to get uh, international recognition for the plight of this Bahama warbler, and hopefully we can get some more help to, to save this species. And so it was right about at this point where my thoughts went from uh, science and gathering data to figuring out a way for the community to rally together and protect these birds. And so I began working along with the help of my team on a grant for us to do a project called Empowering Communities for Conservation. And so we wrote this project uh, along with Rewild so that we can execute uh, trainings for community members so that they would have a, a more direct connection to these ecosystems and potentially give them ways to benefit from these ecosystems as tour guides. <clears throat> it was very good that we were able to secure funding to hire two individuals to execute this work on the ground because Due to the COVID pandemic, our ability to travel to Abaco and execute this work was, was severely limited. And so we were able to hire Chris Johnson and Lavonda, Lavonda Forbes to go out and execute surveys of the bird populations in Abaco, as well as execute community outreach work. One of the other great outcomes of this work was that we were able to band the first five Bahama, Warbler, Bahama Warblers ever banded uh, in the history of this species. And so we are now able to go out and do resetting work to determine um, are these birds staying in the same areas? Do they have a high degree of site fidelity? What areas is a specific bird using? How large is the range of that bird? And potentially we can assess the life expectancy of these birds. So how long does a Bahama warbler live? 
eventually we're going to need to know all of these factors of this bird's life history if we expect to be able to conserve them uh, into the future. So now that we're thinking about this through a sustainable development lens, we want to think about you know, how do we go about doing sustainable development and how do we integrate these thoughts into our work as conservation biologists. Previously, there was a very uh, generalized conception of sustainable development where we were looking for that nexus, that middle ground, where we're serving the environment, the society, and the economy. And from this, we've grown to a new understanding of sustainable development where we're addressing each of these problems in our society through 17 goals that were suggested by the UN. And so as conservation biologists, we typically think about life below water and life on land. And recently it's become very important for us to consider climate action as a part of our work. As we progress, we're gonna to need to incorporate many more of the facets of sustainable development in our work if we expect to create long lasting change and actually get the assistance of the international community that is working on all of these goals. And so we wanna think about reducing poverty. We know that these ecosystems support lifestyles on these communities in these remote islands. And so if we don't secure uh, a long-term well-being for these ecosystems, it's gonna be difficult for us to guarantee the same for the, the communities around there. We're thinking about zero hunger, health and well-being, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Uh, this is extremely interesting when we consider the potential for uh, blue carbon projects that capitalize on the mangrove restoration happening across the Bahamas as a way for us to sell these carbon credits on the international market and add more funding to our conservation initiatives. And one key part of this work is going to be integrating the community in the work so that the support for this, this, this carbon sequestration work goes directly to communities. We wanna think about reducing inequalities. Uh, one of the big challenges we have is the inequality between our uh, communities on these islands, specifically when we think about uh, immigrant communities. And so we need to think about reducing inequality between communities especially in inequality of, of knowledge. And so we need to find a way to engage every community on these islands in conservation activities. We wanna think about sustainable cities and communities and, and how we can gear our infrastructure development towards a sustainable future. Uh, if we think about what happened in the past, we had to do a lot of work in installing culverts to allow water to enter mangroves after there were bridges made. These bridges served remote communities that needed to be able to move around the island, but they also did a disservice to the ecological communities around them. And so if we were able to think further ahead and incorporate our ideas or our knowledge about the environments that we live in, as we develop our infrastructure, we'll be able to have a, a more efficient process of development. The last one that I wanna to touch on is gender equality. And so uh, I just wanted to share this photo these are some of our eco tour guide participants in Grand Bahama. And if you notice, we have a, a wide demographic here. We have multiple age ranges and they're all females. And so I just wanted to highlight how important it is for us to address each of these uh, concerns as we go about our work so that we can integrate, once again, sustainable development into our work as conservation biologists. Uh, the last really cool outcome of our work in the eco tour guide training was that uh, Bimini Vista Adventures was able to incorporate bird tours into their business model on Bimini after taking part in our eco tour guide training in Grand Bahama. And so this to me represents a very sustainable way of us, you know, having a long term impact on a community after $50,000 had been invested in this training exercise in hiring two individuals and then also helping a business add a new product that is sustainable and environmentally conscious to uh, their list of offerings. In conclusion, I want to acknowledge all of our partners in this work, including Friends of the Environment who provided housing for us while we were executing the Eco Tour Guide training in Abaco. And uh, I wanted to leave the floor open for questions. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, and I really appreciate you guys listening to this talk. Awesome, thank you so much, Bradley. Um, that concludes our talks for today. Thank you everybody. Um
um, for your attendance and for listening. And thank you to our panelists. Um, I just want to share the results from the earlier polls that we did. Um, our majority of attendees were students and community members, which is awesome. Um, and we have 59% of attendees who are attending ASAC for the first time. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to launch one more poll just before we go into the question and answer. Great, thank you everybody. And based on that poll, it seems like the most concern is geared towards mangroves and coral reefs. And I see in the chat, we have some all of the above. Thank you all. So we're gonna get into our question and answers really quickly. Um, panelists, I may need your assistance in answering some of these. Um, so our first question is from Stephen Murray. Um, and he says, very interested in any commentary on the pine forest. I assume the lack of the shade the pines provided will change the ecosystem that survived under them. I also assume that this has happened before in history and nature finds a way. Was any of the forest replants from the logging that went on in the early 1900s? And does that affect how the forests might come back? And I think I'm gonna call on Bradley to help me with that one. Um, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, thank you, Liana. Um, so we have a couple of things going here in this, this concept and it happens often where we, compare what's happening now to what happened previously. Uh, I would point out that uh, during the logging procedures, there were seed trees left. Uh, and oftentimes those seed trees were not the healthiest tree, not the most uh, valuable for its lumber. And the result of that is that a lot of the genetics of the current pine forest we have might be based on those uh, seed trees that might not have been the healthiest trees. In addition, when these trees grew back, they grew back in a very abnormal fashion. So they call it dog hair growth. So when you clear out a forest and, and you clear out a forest entirely, you're going to have a ton of light that's available and you're going to have a ton of seedlings come up if the conditions are favorable. And so then you have trees that are more tall and spindly as opposed to trees that are able to grow out wide and healthy for, compared to when you have a forest where one or two trees die at a time and you have different age groups of trees growing up. So that's one reason why our forests might be prone to damage is that they're actually secondary growth. So they're not the existing forests that came up under natural conditions. The other reason why our forests might be compromised is the increased frequency of these storms. So with uh, climate change, we expect that we're going to not just have uh, sea levels rising or the temperature of the, of the sea rising. We're going to have more storms and more severe storms. So you're going to have greater areas of pine forest exposed to more saltwater inundation more frequently. So when a sapling comes to grow back now, uh, maybe within two to three years, it's hit by another storm and unable to grow back. And so at that point, then you no longer have the seed bank because you don't have these trees growing back and shedding seeds that are gonna allow them to grow. In addition, you have these trees that are waiting for uh, this saltwater intrusion to, to go away. And we don't know what that's doing to the soil in these pine forests. If it's having a longer lasting effect and we need the soil to be rinsed out, or if the soil is, if a tree can grow back there two weeks after the storm, after it's dried out. 
So to address some of these concerns, the BNT executed a webinar on pine forest restoration. There's actually been a lot of pine restoration done in Turks and Caicos, and they even go as far as to plant specific genotypes. So specific, if you were to think about a genotype, uh, you have two individuals that are from uh, two different parts of the world. They might both be humans, but their genes are different. Uh, the same is true for different communities of pine trees. And so what they do is that they focus on these genetics. And so they, they, they plant a specific geno genotype in a specific area where that genotype came from. And one of the big take homes is that it takes three years of nursery propagation. So you have to have these trees in a nursery for three years before you can plant them out. And so it's gonna take the Bahamas to develop skills. So we need to have horticulturalists who can devote themselves to doing this work. It has to happen over a long period of time. And so it's gonna take a lot of help. And that's why it's important for us to integrate all of these responses to our environmental challenges with sustainable development so that we can build a community that takes care of its environment. Great, thank you, Bradley. Um, our next question is also from Stephen Murray, um, geared toward Justin's talk. Um, how long does it take for the mangroves to repopulate in areas that are not replanted in? Um, I was recently by Mangrove Key near Grand Bahama and it looks like 5% of the old large mangroves survived. Do the dead mangroves affect the ability for new ones to take hold? Justin, you're muted, sorry. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, so Stephen, honestly, there's no research that I am aware of um, that has ever looked at that. Um, but uh, just from what I've been seeing uh, of the natural regeneration that's been going on, um, as Will pointed out in his, his presentation with his special analysis um, data, uh, there are, the pl there are plants that survived the storm that are now starting to come back up because there is no more competition with larger trees above it. So there's a lot more light, a lot more photosynthesis going on. So they're coming up because those, uh, those roots um, from the larger trees actually protected those younger ones uh, from the storm. And then also they're important because it's those larger trees that are dead um, are helping hold that so hold that sediment together, and then as they degrade, um, that's adding more nutrients for them to grow. I don't know, Will, if you want to add some more to that. Yeah, great answer, Justin. The only thing that I would add uh, is that the it's really important to try to do the restoration mark as quickly as possible, um, and that's because the the way that the root systems of mangroves work is that when the mangroves are live the root systems actually have a huge amount of these little hairs and really fibrous thin uh, like small parts of the root system. And what that does is it creates uh, space in the mud habitat. Um, and as time goes on and those mangroves die, that soil and mud can start to get compacted because those roots don't no longer will support uh, as much interstitial space in the mud. Um, and so yeah, when you don't restore, that's that's a risk, is that that mud will compact over time and then it will no longer be habitat that can support mangroves. So a lot of what we're trying to do is restore uh, before that process takes hold so that we can retain as much mangrove habitat as possible. Great, thank you guys. And I'm gonna ask that you stay close because the next question is also about Mangroves um, from Mark Grosby. How long does it take the mangroves to mature? So for it, when they're in, so for where we are planting, um, where there are adult fringing mangroves um, that has an, in areas that have enough nutrients, it will take anywhere from three to five years for them to get to a size where they are actually able to produce propagules. But for them to get to true adult size, like wait, like what? Whatever, how big we say some of those trees are, fifteen feet tall. Will in some areas, um, that's that takes decades. Great, thank you. 
Um, our next question is for uh, Krista and Will's presentation. Um, there's two questions. Firstly, what do you think could be the cause of loss of fish biomass? Good question. Um, so for the sites where we know that there were some significant differences, um, some of that was driven by changes in parrot fish populations. So for those of you that may be familiar with um, Mermaid Reef in Abaco, there used to be a lot of resident parrot fish around there. And for that site, uh, when we went back to do some of those reassessments, uh, we weren't seeing some of those species. Um, one of the sites where we did see an increase that could just be due to a really large predator, a barracuda there that can influence that. But we're, we're seeing this trend across different functional groups, not just um, you know, those particular species. So it's something we wanna look at a little bit more closely. Uh, one of the possibilities is that for sites where we did see significant loss in structural complexity, it may mean that those species no longer have those areas and have moved elsewhere. Um, it's possible that, um, you know, we may have lost some species during the storm, um, but you know it's too early to definitively say, but those are all some possibilities for why we're seeing changes in fish biomass. Great, thank you. And the second question for you guys, uh, without water quality test results over time, could cruise ship effluents or ballast discharge and or hurricanes contribute to coral bleaching events? Uh, so another good question. Um, so coral bleaching actually happens when corals get stressed and they expel the symbi symbiotic algae that lives within their tissues and that's what gives them their color and their pigmentation. Um, and typically we're really familiar here with that happening with increases in water temperature due to climate change and global warming as Bradley alluded to, but it can also happen when they're De sharp decreases in water temperature when there are drastic changes in salinity or turbidity. Um, and we actually had water quality uh, hobo data loggers uh, at some of our sites um, that we were able to pull up that data. And there were drastic in uh, decreases in water temperature during the storm. And we also had a high increase in turbidity. And it's probably a combination of those things um, that led to bleaching uh, that we saw immediately after Hurricane Dorian. Um, but effluents from, from boats and other eutrophication, other nutrient loading runoff is more likely to cause coral diseases um, than it is for, for bleaching. But bleached corals then tend to be more susceptible to disease. So um, another good question. Great. And there's another one geared toward you guys. There's a few more. Um, regarding corals, what should be the frequency of satellite analysis and what is the approximated cost? Uh, that's a great question. So if you mean satellite analysis, uh, satellite data is being sort of collected continuously by a number of different systems that are up in space. Um, it's it's tricky to look at specific coral health using that because they're not high enough resolution. Uh, for us, when we're doing our in-water photomosaics and aerial drone surveys that can provide really high resolution data to look at coral reef health, we, we're you know, trying to collect that type of data as often as we can. Um, and across the Bahamas, we, we do that. And so, you know, we hope to be able to collect more data in, in the Abacos, you know, every couple years, um, every or like, you know, between two to five years, I would say is a, is a good interval, unless it's a really specific study that we're trying to look at, you know, like disease progression across a reef. And in some cases, that means that we're going to monitor on a monthly basis uh, to watch, you know, diseases like stony coral tissue loss disease travel across a population of corals. But yeah, the that's a great question. The, the cost of satellite data is really just the cost of it, obtaining it. Some of it's freely available um, for the photo mosaics and drones that, you know, there's a large upfront cost because the cameras are expensive or the drones are expensive, but it's really a matter of getting resources together to actually go to these places because some of them are pretty remote. Great, thank you. And I just wanna take the time to say that question was from Charles de la Baume, who is um, a member, a founder of the Bahamian Environment Protection Foundation, 
who funded this event. So we are very grateful for them. Um, and we are glad that they could be here and participate. Um, okay, Krista and Will, can you speculate a little more why the tissue loss disease has not been found on Abaco? And that's from Craig Lehman, says great presentations, everyone. Okay. Yep, that's another <laughs> great question. You guys are definitely paying attention. Um, and the answer is we're not sure. We're happy that it hasn't spread to Abaco um, as yet. Um, based on some of the assessments that we've done around uh, New Providence and Grand Bahama, we believe that you know it's uh, ballast water and ships that potentially brought the disease to the Bahamas from Florida, where it's been for a number of years. It was first uh, introduced there in 2014. Um, and then a combination of vessel traffic currents and other natural vectors could potentially be spreading that disease around. Um, but we haven't been back in the water in Abaco um, on the reef since um, we did those reassessments uh, in April, 2021. Hopefully stony coral tissue loss disease is not there. Um, yet, I think uh, sort of the anthro pause that Charlotte mentioned um, associated with COVID probably helped in terms of um, reducing vessel traffic uh, around Abaco. Um, so that's something else. I don't know if Will has any anything else to add there. Yeah, I, I, all of that's great. I, I think that the only thing that I would add is that it's, it's more than likely only a matter of time. Um, before it gets to the abacos. And so, you know, the longer it holds off, the more prepared we can be for it and the more strategies we'll have to treat it. So, you know, we hope that it will take longer to, to reach the abacos. Um, but yeah, it really is just a matter of time, I think, before it gets to pretty much everywhere in the Caribbean. Yeah, and just so people are aware, it's a disease that we have documented on other islands in the Bahamas um, as well. So um, the sooner we can uh, work on implementing strategies to prevent the spread and to treat corals, um, the better. Yep. Great, thank you. We definitely have a love for corals um, in these questions. Um, so this next question, in photo mosaics, what is the average amount of pictures you would need to make a map of coral? That's a great question. Uh, generally speaking, if a lot of our plots for monitoring are 10 to 15 meters by 10 to 15 meters. So you're talking on the order of 100 to 250 square meters in total. And that usually takes around one to 2000 photos, I would say. And it requires a pretty powerful computer to analyze them for overlap and then stitch them together but you can really use almost any camera system. Some folks use GoPros. Uh, we use high resolution DSLRs because they provide better quality and you can see things at the half millimeter scale. So you can resolve individual polyps in a lot of cases. Great, thanks. Um, and these next questions I'm gonna open to all panelists. Um, we have some questions about volunteer opportunities, as well as how um, the youth can help with building back um, our ecosystems. So I will let anyone respond. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, so for the mangrove restoration project, uh, lots of volunteer opportunities coming up. Um, we always need people for planting. And then in the summertime, all we're doing is collecting seeds and, and expanding our nursery. So I always need extra hands for that. Um, so I'd say best thing to do, get in contact with those at Friends of the Environment, get in contact with Miana, get in contact with Mandisha, with Olivia, and get your name down the list. So when the next event comes up, you can be contacted and then participate in our event. Yeah, hi, we, we just um, put, replied within the chat itself, the question and answer um, session. But um, yeah, we, we will be looking for volunteers to help with the dolphin recovery plan. Um, and that's more targeted towards community members and not just students. And we have, we have programs in place for students um, through internships and our whale camp program in the summer. But um, uh, we put our website or uh, sorry email contact in that um, in the answer there so 
yeah, volunteers are very, very welcome. Thanks. And I guess I'll go next. Um, similar to Charlotte and Diane, um, we also have internship opportunities um, available. Um, and then we also have the reef rescue network that's been going on for a long time for people that are interested in and coral reef uh, research and restoration to get involved there. Um, once um, certain things are in place, we will be working on mangrove restoration. Um, and um, so we'll potentially have volunteer opportunities for the communities there. Um, so I'll let Will chime in if there's anything else and I'll put our um, contact information in the chat box as well. No, that's great, Krista. I don't, I don't really have anything to add to that. Um, but yeah, the more, the more help, the merrier. It takes a village to keep our ecosystem afloat. And I guess I should chime in as well. Uh, so the Bahamas National Trust, we do have a few internship programs going, uh, and I believe there's also one on Grand Bahama in addition to ones in New Providence. Uh, and also uh, working along with uh, the Office of the Prime Minister, there will be a conference for youth, a regional climate change conference uh, hosted at University of the Bahamas uh, in July. And we will be issuing, you know, we're gonna be selecting high schoolers and college students to participate in trainings that avail people who are interested in working in policy, in finance, in many other facets of, the, of, of our economy and help them to understand how they can serve the environment while they do their jobs. Um, so Bahamas National Trust website or find us on Facebook and then also look out for more information about the Regional Youth Climate Conference. Thank you so much to all of our panelists, all of our attendees, the BEP Foundation who sponsored the event today. Um, it was a really great webinar um, and we're so thankful that you could all join us. Um, we've got to wrap up because we're over our time, but if anyone has uh, further questions for us or for the panelists, you're welcome to email them to us. Um, I'll put my email in the chat box and we'll see about getting them on to the panelists to get some answers for you. Um, so thank you again, everybody, and I um, hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for hosting. Bye. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.